Okay, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Vikram Matve uh, to the uh, Distinguished Speaker Seminar today. Vikram is the Donald B. Gillies Professor of Computer Science, which sounds very weighty. <laughs> uh, so that's an endowed chair at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and uh, you probably all, hopefully you all know about uh, the great work that they did in the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which is pretty much the compiler that every academic uh, researcher working in compiler uses today. So uh, without further ado, he's going to tell us about the next stage of, of this uh, great uh, project. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. So uh, first, thank you very much all for both for inviting me and for coming to the talk. It's my first time in Irvine, but I have to say I'm very impressed by the campus, the city, the views, <laughs> the, the mountains. I didn't realize the mountains are this close. <laughs> it's actually very cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a couple of projects that are sort of tied together by this theme of virtual instruction sets. And this is joint work with a whole collection of my PhD students. Um, I just named two people, Will Dietz and Maria Kotsifaku. Will was the lead on the AllVM project, and Maria is the lead on the HPVM project. So he is for both of them. They're both still in my group here. So just to give some context. <laughs> After all that, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, just to give some context. Programming languages have been uh, developed since pretty much the 50s. And compilers for those languages were developed starting with the IBM Fortran 1 compiler since the late 50s. And the way that programs, at least for static languages now, have been compiled and linked and shipped has more or less stayed the same. There's been one major change in the 90s. So basically, compilers generate machine code and that machine code is linked together by a linker, and that machine code, that linked program, is then shipped and executed on some user machine. Right? And then in the 90s, compile, production compilers started actually linking IR, the internal representation of a compiler, which is basically a much richer representation that's used for analysis and transformations, so that they could do interprocedural optimization across files. But then that code was translated to machine code and then shipped. And that's pretty much the way that um, compilers have operated for static languages since the 50s. Um, and um, I think there's an alternative model which, uh, instead of shipping machine code, essentially ships a much richer representation, which are virtual instruction sets. And these are pretty popular in some domains, like in Java and .NET, and actually even in the GPU world. Um, and the idea there is that instead of shipping machine code, what you ship is a virtual instruction set of some kind. And then uh, when you know what machine you're going to be running on, you translate that to machine code. And so what you're really doing is having compilers, front ends generate internal representations, which is what the compilers use that gets linked into a program or a partial program in their libraries. And then that's what gets shipped it's a virtual instruction set form. And you can either do static code generation. You don't have to just compile this just in time like the Java world does. Um, you can do ahead of time code generation. You can do just in time code generation. You can even do runtime optimization, although very few systems actually do that. You could even do offline or idle time optimization, as we call it. I don't know any system that actually does that, but in principle, you could. But the point is that in all these cases, the virtual instruction set, if it's well, def well designed, can enable much richer analysis and transformations, much richer analysis capabilities than you can do on machine code. And we generally call this virtual instruction set computing. So the idea is, in contrast to reduced instruction sets or complex instruction sets, here using virtual instruction sets. And the idea is what the form of computing depends on the nature of the instruction set you ship. Right? So that's sort of the, the context. And, and so informally, virtual instruction set computing is any kind of model where a software ISA, the software, that, the ISA that's used to ship, represent software, differs from the actual instruction set that's used to execute code on the machine. And what virtual ISA you should use depends on the context. There's, you don't have to have one universal virtual ISA. So just as a few examples, um, for low level static languages like C and C++ and Fortran and Swift and Rust and so on, um, we 
uh, could imagine, so LLVM is a virtual instruction set that we've developed in my group and compiler IR, which I'll say a little bit more about, not too much, because that's an older project that's been, it's pretty mature at this point. But I'll talk a lot more about an extension uh, called AllVM, which is taking this to the next level, where all the code on the system is in, is in LLVM form. Um, all the code for static languages. Um, in the managed language world, this is pretty universally used, actually. So for example, for Java and C Sharp and F Sharp and Scala, typically you use a virtual instruction set, either, J either JVM bytecode or MSIL for .NET virtual machines. And that's a universal model for these managed languages today. For parallel systems, so for example, for GPUs, it's very common that people use either, NVIDIA uses PTX, AMD, and a few other companies standardized HSA, uh, IL. Um, the OpenCL community has standardized something called Spear, which some of you may have heard of, uh, and the current version is Spear 5. These are widely used now for GPUs. So when you do GPGPU computing, typically your code is shipped in this virtual instruction set form. That depends on which family of GPUs you're running on. But then some driver actually translates it to machine code for the GPU and does pretty significant optimization and code generation. And this is a very important part of the portability story for the <coughs> GPU. But more generally, the heterogeneous systems are much more diverse than just GPUs. So for example, you have FPGAs, you have domain-specific accelerators. Systems on chips today are typically quite heterogeneous. And so we have a project called Heterogeneous Parallel Virtual Machine, which is an extension of LLVM to essentially design a virtual instruction set and compiler IR for heterogeneous systems. And the goal is very similar to the GPU model. It's to be able to get both performance and portability in the heterogeneous world. Um, and then finally, in domain-specific languages, you could imagine actually shipping code that has information about the domain <coughs> that is being computed. So for example, uh, for tensor computations, there are many domains that use tensors today. And the knowledge about tensor operations can be important to generate good code for a particular, let's say, machine learning accelerator or something that has high level tensor style operations on the machine. Um, nobody actually does this, to my knowledge. It's always compiled ahead of time. But um, you could imagine building domain specific languages, I mean, sorry, uh, virtual instruction sets for domain specific languages. And in fact, we have a early project extension of HPVM that essentially does that for tensor computations. I won't have time to talk about that today. It's very early anyway. It's, I don't have much uh, in the way of results yet on that. But um, So more broadly, and just stepping back here, um, the, the research that we're doing in our group sort of has this vision that we believe all software should be shipped in virtual instruction set. Um, it doesn't have to be the same virtual instruction set for all of it. You can have different virtual instruction sets for different languages. Um, but in particular, there are some significant benefits. So first, there are no inherent performance penalties. This is a common misconception that because of the success of Java, <coughs> people sort of assume that you have to do just-in-time compilation in order to do a, a successful virtual instruction set. So, and the whole managed language world typically uses just-in-time compilation, although C sharp, .NET uh, has implementations that do, that do it. But you really don't need to do just-in-time compilation. You can do ahead-of-time compilation and optimization and get all the performance that you would get if you were uh, just doing static ahead-of-time code generation. And moreover, I think on top of that, there are pretty strong performance benefits. And <coughs> I'll show you some results today about uh, from the AllVM project, they appear at Oopsla, and from the HPVM project that appear at PPOP that talk about the performance benefits of virtual instruction There are also uh, strong security benefits. We had a project called Secure Virtual Architecture, which I think Michael is quite familiar with, maybe some of you have heard of. Um, I won't talk about it today, but we have a, a, a set of papers on that. And that talked about the security benefits of being able to um, essentially do much better combinations of static analysis and dynamic analysis on systems code, in, which was the focus of our work. And the fourth point here is that it is not only technically feasible, it's also commercially acceptable. So um, 
you know, the Java world sort of shows this, but remember that uh, Java and .NET, those are very specialized languages. So you can't generalize that to static languages like C and C++, C++ and Objective-C and Swift and all this. But, there are, but Apple routinely now run, ships code from the apps to their app store in LLVM form. And I'll just say a couple more words about that. So it's very much technically feasible and commercially acceptable. So that's our proposal. And so in this talk, I'm just going to go through uh, a couple of the examples that I showed on that slide about different virtual instruction sets. I'll talk very briefly about LLVM first, just to set some context, because the rest of the work sort of has built on it. Um, but it also shows a commercially successful example of using it for static languages. Um, LLVM is a virtual instruction set and internal representation. I'm actually going to skip this slide. I meant to hide it. Um, <laughs> Uh, it sort of shows an example of LLVM, but I don't have time to talk about that in any detail. I'm happy to talk about it offline, of course. And by the way, people, you're more than welcome to interrupt with questions. Do not feel shy to ask if you have any during the talk. Um, so why is LLVM a good choice as a virtual instruction set? Basically, LLVM is the internal representation of the LLVM compiler infrastructure. And there have been many compilers built with it, both research and uh, production compilers that are widely used today in industry. But it's not just a compiler uh, internal representation. It can be used as a virtual instruction set also because it's fully executable. It's basically a language, just like Java bytecode is a fully executable language, but LLVM is the same as the compiler IR, unlike JVM bytecode. It enables sophisticated program analysis and transformations. Um, in fact, it is the internal representation for a compiler that does that already. We have extensive production quality infrastructure and tools, partly because the community has contributed a huge amount of, uh, of capabilities to this. It's used by many companies in, in a number of products. There are many front ends for a wide range of languages. Many languages have built front ends recently and a very wide range of back ends. So it's a pretty robust and mature infrastructure, but from a technical point of view, it's really that it's executable and can be used for sophisticated analysis. But a second reason, which is more of a, I think, sort of um, infrastructure reason to do this, and, and an example of how it's been used is, so LLVM early on was primarily used as for static compilers in industry, even though the original research vision was as a, as a, as a way to ship code, right? as, a, as a language for what we call lifelong compilation. And in fact, in our original paper, we talk about using a virtual instruction set to do analysis and transformations um, at any point in time, so compile time, link time, and then after shipping at install time, at load and run time, and even idle time, which is sort of the name we use for between executions. If you have a rich virtual instruction set, you can do much more than with binary code at any point in time. Static compilers don't do that. They basically only do anything sophisticated before shipping code. So that's compile time and link. But more recently now, there are systems that actually do better than that. They actually ship virtual instruction. They actually ship LLVM code. So all, app, all of Apple's devices, the, the iPhones, iPads, tablets, uh, sorry, these are <coughs> Apple Watch, Apple TV, um, all of those systems now uh, use LLVM as the way to ship for apps, to ship code to the App Store. And then in the App Store, they actually generate machine code for whatever device that actually is actually running the software. And uh, this gives them much more control over what binary code is actually running. It lets them tailor the code to the actual device. I believe it also lets them do better security checking on what APIs are used, because they have strict requirements for the apps in their app store, um, on what APIs can be used for different apps. And uh, binary code is harder to, to check that with any certainty. And in fact, um, in the app distribution guide for iOS, they have this quote. They say that for iOS apps, bitcode is the default. It is optional, but it is the default. Unless you do something special in Xcode, this is what will ha normally happen. And for watches and for tvOS apps, bitcode is required. So essentially, this is becoming the normal model for them to ship code. And that's important because what it's saying is that it is both technically feasible and commercially acceptable to be able to use a virtual instruction set and ship code in that model even for static languages. 
including non-type safe languages, which is actually a significant technical uh, challenge. But okay, so so this is being used, but I think there are actually a whole bunch of interesting research questions and capabilities that have not really been explored. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk. Um, I think the users to date are pretty limited. They're ad hoc. What Apple actually does with it or other companies actually do with it are pretty uh, limited in terms of the technical uh, potential that there is. So the benefits of performance, for portability, for security, for software reliability have not been explored enough. There's obviously been a rich literature in the Java space, but that doesn't really carry over to the system software space. And so I'm going to talk about two projects today, all VM, where the main focus is on performance. And that's in the context of static sort of scalar and vector language uh, code. And then the second one is HP VM, where the goals are to get both portability and performance. Um, and this is in the context of heterogeneous parallel uh, software. So I am sort of breezing through slides here and not getting any questions. So let me stop for a moment and see if anybody has a question or anything you would like to ask. Yeah. If you ship the LLVM code and yeah. the user reader, it makes it harder to protect your IP for the closed source component. Yeah, so that's one of the most common questions we get, and it's a good question. The question is, um, isn't it harder to protect your IP, your intellectual property, if you ship something richer than machine code, right? And in fact, our program manager from ONR, Carno, who also funds uh, a big project for Michael, that was one of his first concerns, like we don't want to ship machine, uh, IR. But in fact, I think there's a, there's a myth underlying that binary code is not a good protector of IP. In fact, with reverse engineering tools and some significant manual effort, which is what people do for reverse engineering, you can reconstruct a lot of information about source code. And so really to protect IP, you have to do something proactive. You have to do something like code obfuscation, for example, where you, you explicitly hide names, string na strings, type names, variable names. It's funny, compilers never look at strings. They never look at names, right? But people do, and you get a lot of information from that. And that kind of deobfuscation is much more effective. Right? You can also do encryption. So you can, you can use encryption keys and lock the code so that it cannot be decrypted by anything other than the machine that runs it, which is what, in fact, um, most set-top boxes do now. Right? So, yeah. Is it possible to do obfuscation in the LLVM with this notation? It's certainly possible. I think what you would find is that, so first, names can easily be obfuscated. It doesn't, compilers don't even look at that, so we don't, it doesn't affect performance at all. Um, if you want to do control flow obfuscation, that can always have a performance hit. But that has nothing to do with whether it's LLVM or not LLVM. So for example, you can take binary code and do office control flow obfuscation. For example, you can convert every branch into an indirect branch. So you have no idea what the control flow graph is. Right? That's going to affect, that is going to actually <coughs> affect performance more if you do it at the LLVM level because the code generator, the back end code generator is not yet run. And so you might get worse performance at that point. So that's true. That, that is certainly a performance. Other questions? Okay, so um, I'm not going to say anything more about LLVM. I'm happy to talk to people offline about that. I want to talk about the two main projects in the group right now. Uh, so let me start with all VM. Um, so the idea behind all VM is essentially to take LLVM to, in some sense, its natural um, conclusion, which is. What if you could ship essentially all the code on a system in a unified virtual instruction set representation? At least all the code that is uh, in a certain class of languages, like static languages, right? And so um, you can imagine that in two different models, either with only user space or with user space and the operating system. Um, and so in the user space case, all applications, all dynamic and static libraries would all be represented in virtual instruction set form. And you have, you have to have some interface to the operating system, and the, that's essentially the, the role that libc plays on, on systems today, and that's what we do also. In this case, the operating system is still native machine code. The other model is where everything, literally everything on the system, with the possible exception of a bootloader, is in virtual instruction set form. 
And we have built prototypes of both of these. Um, most of the research we're doing is on the model on the left, where we're focusing on user space. But we have built entire kernels, so both the Linux kernel and the FreeBSD kernel, in LLVM bitcode form. And it will boot and run software. So, and essentially, it'll run, it's a fully uh, functioning operating system. So it is quite feasible to do either one of these two models. Um, so the way the LLVM system works, uh, sorry, the all VM system works is it's basically a, a small extension of what LLVM does. Um, and I'll come talk to the, about the extension in a moment. But the idea is that um, you can take any front end that can generate LLVM, which is a lot of front ends. Um, you can also take binary, if, if you have binary components, for some reason, you can translate that, you can do a binary lifting to LLVM bitcode. Um, in fact, Michael's group is doing that in a much more sophisticated way than we are. We have a sort of relatively straightforward extension. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is part of the ONR funding that, that we're both getting. And anyway, so you can get LLVM for all components if you like. You can then link them to interpersonal optimizations. And now we convert that into a representation that we call an all XC. And that is the main change really conceptually from the normal LLVM model. So I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide, about what an all XC is. Um, and uh, an all XC can have multiple files in it, but then you can link them together by a tool we call all together. Um, and it's intentionally misspelled, by the way, because it's the all VM project. Right? So uh, that generates an all XC that's fully executable. And that conceptually is what you would ship um, in experiments, we just run it all in our machines, but in, in principle, you can ship that. This is a fully executable program and fully self-contained. And then you can run that on an end user machine with a tool called Ali. And um, that normally, if you just run it directly, it would run with the LLVM JIT. Um, that's just the standard LLVM JIT, which is a mainline and you can, anybody can use it. But we don't want to pay the performance penalty of the JIT every time. And so we can transparently cache native machine code. So we have, a, we use the normal LLVM static code generator, generate machine code for the program and cache it, but that is transparent. So when you actually run the program, Ali will check the cache and find the binary code and then run that instead, if it already exists. So this way you're actually just getting the performance of ahead of time code generation instead of doing just in time. Okay. So that's basically the LLVM tools. And uh, the main difference, again, as I said here, is besides the fact that we're doing this for everything, is that the, the representation is basically trying to make the LLVM model a little more rigorous in terms of what the semantics of the doing was. So in particular, an all XC is just one or more LLVM bitcode <laughs> files that represent a program. But it, we, in sort of in practical terms, we include all the libraries that would be used for the application. And the semantics of this is that it is as if all the bit code files will be statically linked. In fact, they are, they will eventually be statically linked. And the only non-LLVM piece here is the interface to the systems. And so this gives us two benefits. One, static linking means that the program is fully self-contained. You're never dependent on what dynamic libraries, what versions, or any other platform dependencies that might exist on the system on which you're running. Um, and second, even the interface to the underlying system is fully known. There is no such thing as an, an external library that we don't know about, because libc is very well defined. So we know exactly what its semantics is. And so in fact, when you want to do whole program compilation, or whole program analysis, most people use that term, but in fact, in practice, what they mean is whole program except for those libraries that I know nothing about, and I actually have to be very conservative about it. Here, there's no such thing. Here, it's, when you say whole program, you really mean whole program, because we know everything about the program. This has some benefits. So first, it's much more robust. You don't get install time failures because of missing libraries, because of incompatible libraries, or any of the, anything like that, which in practice is actually a surprisingly painful problem. I think the entire programming models like Rust and, and um, Go and others, they've sort of been designed with this goal from the beginning that they will not have these kinds of problems. But many other languages don't have that benefit. The second benefit is size. So with full, whoops, I have no idea what I did. 
I think I will. Oh, it's just next slide, yeah. <laughs> Um, size, so with full static linking, you can actually reduce the code size significantly because you know much better what is really needed and what is not needed. Uh, in fact, I'll show results from how much, what a difference that makes. Um, it improves performance because you, for two reasons in fact. One, that you can, you don't have the overheads of dynamic linking, so when you do, when you make a call to a library or you're doing any kind of uh, operation or, or referencing global variables across the static dynamic boundary, you don't have the level of indirection that you normally have with dynamic linking. And second, you can do much better optimization, compiler optimization across all boundaries, basically across the entire program, including with dynamic libraries. Traditionally, um, there is no system I know of that can optimize across the application dynamic library boundary because a dynamic library is basically just an opaque blob of binary code. Whereas in this model, there is no, there are no dynamic libraries, and so you can do optimization across the whole program and all its libraries. And the, like I said earlier, the semantics is really like, for whole, you can do much more, you can do true whole program analysis because you know the whole program. It actually also eliminates a, a whole category of attacks that happen through dynamic loading of code. So for example, there's a well-known exploit on Samba the Samba server, uh, which is in the CVE, which happened by basically installing a dynamic library on a program that was malicious. And because the program would load that dynamic library, it allowed basically full code injection on that system. And you completely eliminate that because we insist on static linking. <coughs> Obviously this has some restrictions. So the most important restrictions are you cannot, for example, update parts of a program by replacing a dynamic library. So you are incurring some restrictions for this. And second, um, uh, you cannot do what is sometimes called introspection, where you do DL open and DL sim to look up a symbol name in some library at runtime and load a piece of code to dynamically extend functionality in applications. In practice, very, very few applications actually do that, or at least need to do that. There are applications that do it just because it exists, but not because they really need it. There are very few applications that really, really need to do it. So we don't think these are serious restrictions, but they are, uh, they so do apply. Performance, what about the machine specific optimizations that you're um, converting the LLVM to the machine code on runtime? No, uh, well, at, at, ahead of time, mostly. Ahead of time, mostly. Yeah, but after you know, so this is the point, right? This happened, this is ahead of time code generation, right? But this happens when you know exactly what machine you're running on. So this could, in principle, do fully machine-specific optimization and code generation. For static and vec for static single-threaded code, the performance gains, the gains are not huge. For caches, you can get some gains. For vector instruction sets, you can get very significant <coughs> gains. We haven't really done that, but other than to the extent that the LLVM uh, backends will take detailed machine descriptions, and so they will optimize for whatever machine description they're given. But the infrastructure, we have not changed for that purpose. For the HPVM project, we've done much more. In fact, HPVM, the whole point of it is that. Yeah? So do you also do <coughs> dynamic sharing of libraries, right, with the possible questions? You right? also what? Do you have dynamic sharing of libraries? That's right, so in fact, I'll talk about that. That is one for, so one of the main things we did is how can you now, how, with this model, so going back to the next slide, because it's full static linking, I think this is your question. With full static linking, you are no longer sharing libraries between applications. And sharing libraries between applications is more or less essential in today's systems because there's so much common code, there's so much code reuse of popular libraries. Right? And in fact, that, is a convenient segue into my next slide, which is actually the subject of the Oopsla paper. It's a topic we call software multiplexing, which is the answer, or a partial answer to that question. Yeah. Your previous slide is Lipsy static or dynamic? Lipsy is static. Um, <coughs> Lipsy is static, yeah. Lipsy is static as well. Yeah, it is static as well. But it's just binary, I mean, yeah, there's no real uh, advantage to loading Lipsy dynamically other than the share, the sharing issue. Are there any security implications of using a cache for storing the, uh, 
Well, so there's always security implications of allowing someone malicious to overwrite code on the end user system. I don't think this model, at least I can't think of a reason right now why, or, or haven't so far, why this model makes that any worse than uh, any known model. Because presumably this cache is protected with the same kind of protections that all files and binary executables have. Today's systems. And like, what is the security implication of uh, running, for example, FreeBSD or Linux in this LLVM thing? I assume you need some kind of a compiler or jitter in the kernel, right? So how how big is, is that part now? You mean if we are doing this for the operating system? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're doing this for the operating system, um, first it doesn't have to be a jitter because again, I think the right model, and this is what we have done by default, we've done both, but, but by default is to do ahead of time code generation. So you're not doing dynamic code generation in the kernel. Um, I think the biggest issue with doing security or, or even correctness issue with this model is that, and this is, comes back to the point of type safe versus not type safe language. With not type safe languages, there are errors that do not that may get uncovered by one compiler that were not uncovered by a different compiler because of undefined behaviors. And that's one issue that is very hard to deal with unless you test the exact compiler and the exact set of options that your program is going to be run with. And that is a disadvantage with this. In fact, one of the projects that we have, one of the research projects we have is uh, to do what's called translation validation, which is to say, for a particular input program, the backend code generator, we don't, we cannot do full formal verification of a production quality backend code generator, but we can try to verify each individual translation, and that's the area called translation validation. So it's a formal proof that the output program is equivalent, in some sense, to the input program, right? and that's a research goal, but it's a research project that we have in the group in order to get more confidence in exactly the, for exactly the reason that you're saying. Okay, all right, so I think I was about to talk about software multiplexing. Um, so, uh, and this project was, uh, this is part of Will Dietz's PhD thesis, who is also the person who built all VM and um, all the tools that I've been talking about so far. All in, in the all VM project. Um, so the point about software multiplexing is to eliminate code duplication in systems. Um, not just in individual programs, but even across programs. And there are many sources, or several, not many, there are several different sources of code duplication at a high level. You can get duplicated libraries across applications. And today, uh, dynamic linking um, for shared libraries is the primary solution that's used to avoid this. Um, second, you can get uh, multiple versions of the same library or multiple versions of the same application on a given system, often because different users or different, so for example, different applications may want different versions of the same library, or different users may want different versions of the same application or the same library. And this is surprisingly common. You go to any system, you're gonna find several versions of more, many major programs on those systems, right? In other words, you're actually duplicating the code in the system. And then uh, you're also very commonly going to see functions and even smaller code fragments that are routinely duplicated across function, across parts of a program and different programs. And software multiplexing is a framework in some sense that can address all of these issues. So far, and the Oopsla paper so, uh, in particular has addressed the first two. Um, and we are now working on the third one, which is sort of going to be the rest of Wim's thesis. Um, and this is just an example to show the kind of benefits that you can get um, compared with static, traditional static linking or traditional dynamic linking. It's a slightly complicated graph, so let me just try and explain it quickly. The goal here was to measure if you have uh, two or more applications that share common libraries. In this case, it's the libqt, uh, it's the whole Qt toolkit, windowing toolkit. And windowing toolkits are one of the most 
popular reasons why people want to do dynamic linking. Because when you have windowing applications, they will have large windowing libraries that are basically all the same. And so in this case, we chose 10 different applications that were all built on top of the Qt framework. And we ran them, ran different numbers of them simultaneously on a machine. This is a standard Linux machine. And we measured the uh, memory usage using a Linux tool that accounts for sharing. So they have this weighted, uh, not weighted exactly, it's a, it's a way to measure how many distinct memory pages are used by a set of processes that are running simultaneously where you don't double count. So if a shared library is in the system shared by two programs, it's only counted once, right? or, or any pages of it. And so P it's called PSS, and that's the measure that we use for the y-axis here. So that's memory consumption, basically me uh, main memory, RAM. And the different lines here show, uh, so the top line here shows the aggregate memory used by these programs, these 10 programs, if they were each individually statically linked, which is a traditional form of static linking. And not surprisingly, it goes up linearly and at a pretty high slope as you increase the number of programs running simultaneously because they're all getting in separate copies of the libraries. Shared libraries, which are the blue and red line in the middle here, uh, make that much better. So you can see that the amount of memory that's used goes down quite significantly when you go from static to dynamic. And the, two, the difference between the two is, is not important, but just so you're clear, uh, the red line uses the GNU version of Libc. The blue line uses a different Libc called the Muscle Libc library, which is widely used in, in, uh, in a number of domains. It's what we use as our Libc. It's essentially a smaller, more compact version of Libc. Um, and there is a small difference between them, but their slope is very similar and they are better than static. But the most important point is the bottom line in green here is what you get with software multiplexing, which is the approach that we use. And what you can see is that as you increase the number of applications, the aggregate amount of memory, RAM that's used, does grow, but it's mainly because the different code in the different application that's using different memory. And this is much better than even the dynamically the shared libraries. And in fact, we see this routinely that there is, so there's a two and a half X improvement compared with static linking, which nobody would, today nobody does static linking for exactly this reason. It's just too wasteful. But even with dynamic linking, in this case, we see a 35% <coughs> improvement when you have 10 applications running. And that's coming from, um, we get the full sharing that the, the shared linking, the dynamic linking gets, but we also get much better optimization that static linking gets. And you get, so you get basically the best of both worlds with software multiplex. And I show a few more results, there are a lot more results in the paper, but let me just quickly explain what this tool does. Um, so the idea is that software multiplexing takes in N applications and K libraries, and this has to be decided ahead of time. So that's one difference with dynamic linking. So you choose N applications and whatever libraries they use and um, the compiler pass called Allmux, uh, which implements software multiplexing, puts out a single program that has all these applications in it. And I'll explain what that means, but basically we call that a multi-call program because that one executable will launch any one of these different programs. And it's fully statically linked and all, the libraries are deduplicated. So you have only one copy of the library, of any library in that final program. And this tool is fully automatic. It, we've uh, uh, used it for thousands of Linux packages, sort of out of, uh, out of the box. That's actually worth thinking about because static linking is not the standard build model for most applications. Most application make files or whatever build system they're using are typically designed for dynamic linking, not static linking. A few may have both options, dynamic or static. And rewriting make files is actually a nightmare. You don't want to have to rewrite make files in order to get people to use any kind of, any kind of tool today. This works completely automatically, and I think that was really one of the main um, benefits of the all VM approach, is that we can do the linking without having to worry about how the build system um, so let me just explain three, three aspects of how this works, but you have a question. Did it write the 
right? So now yeah. any any part of the code, if it's exploit, if it's reachable from my application, will it exploit my application or it makes it That's a good question. So in the paper, we actually spent some time explaining that is not the case. No. Because, um, so his question was, now if you have, let's say, 10 applications in the same binary, does that mean an, uh, an exploitable vulnerability in application one will cause a security attack on some other application, application two or something else? Right? If it's not, if it's basically not application two's code, then application two should not be affected by the vulnerability in application one. Because when you launch application two using this binary, the only code that actually runs is the application two code. The fact that application one is in the same binary doesn't mean that code is going to ever be invoked unless there's a vulnerability in application two that can cause a control flow attack to cause you to jump there. You can, so you have to have vulnerability in application two in order to attack application two. You're not incurring the security vulnerabilities of application one. Does that make sense? So to run any one application, I have to load the big binary block, right? No, because remember, today's operating systems only load pages on demand, right? So with demand paging, you only get the code you actually touch. Okay. So what's the steps when you want to add an application? To yeah, so that's one of the big disadvantages here. You have to, at least in the implementation today, you have to rebuild it from scratch. If you want to add, his question was what happens if you want to add a new application? Um, I think with a little engineering, you can do much better than that, because again, if you're actually shipping code, then you can do it on the end user system on the fly. So it's actually very, not very easy, but relatively easy to do that. But this model works even without shipping code as virtual instruction. Okay, let me take one more question and then I'm going to, <laughs> go ahead, yeah. If an application or a, bike or, or a library is actually updated, then you would have to go through the whole complex process. Again. Yes, that is, a, that is the disadvantage. So you were talking about if you want to update one or add one application, right? it's the same problem. You're right, so the, so the disadvantage here is that you have to predefine what applications and what applications you want to run or that you want to multiplex together. So there are certain contexts where this already happens routinely. For example, when you ship a Docker container, <coughs> Docker containers are widely used, in fact, partly because of all the nightmares of dynamic libraries and all the problems of making sure that people who install software don't have to struggle with all the hassles of installing software and building bringing in all the dependencies and other things. When you have a fully self-contained piece of code with the Docker containers, you don't normally do that kind of dynamic patching. So in a Docker container, this would work really nice. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. I would be happy to take more que questions at the end, if people like. Um, so uh, there are three parts to how this works. The first part is just a simple transformation that takes n programs and adds a wrapper, just a dispatch function called main that launches the appropriate program depending on what name you use to launch, to call the program, to invoke the program. This in fact is what uh, compilers, for example, routinely do. So if you say GCC, you get the C compiler semantics. If you, do, if you say G++, you basically get the C++ compiler semantics because the, the same binary is being dispatched on two different names. Right? And that's why you have symbolic links from different names. And that's really all this is doing, except it's hard to do this manually if you haven't built your programs this way for independent programs. GCC is actually built that way. So this compiler pass just automates that. And it's a, it's a very straightforward pass, but it makes it possible to do it for any set of programs. The second piece, is, which is also relatively straightforward so far, is that we can deduplicate libraries now. So we take n programs and k libraries, and what we output is one program, that's the multi-call part that I talked about in the last slide, plus k prime libraries where k prime is less than or equal to k. Basically all we've done here is compared libraries that are identical by a simple um, static hash of the library contents at the LLVM IR level. So we're not doing anything sophisticated in terms of comparing the static syntax or semantics or anything like that. And then eliminating any duplicate library. And that's what the Allmux, so we have a pass called Allmux, which does so software multiplexing, and that's the main thing that it does. Okay. Um, and that also enables interprocedural optimization across the whole program and all its library, because now you have all the libraries available in statically compiled form. Okay. Um, 
And then the third piece, which is really the tricky part when you don't want to rewrite the build system, the make files, is that we can do static linking even if the make files are written using dynamic linking. And um, there's essentially this follows from the fact that we can do linking at the IR level. So we actually run the normal make process, normal build process, to figure out all the libraries and all the application components or files that were linked together. We run it all the way to getting native code, genera native code generated, but we also save the, the IR for every module that's compiled this way, every file that's compiled this way. And now we have the full set of files that needs to be linked together. And then all we do is run the LLVM linker on that full set of files. So all we're doing is really using the standard make system to discover the set of files that need to be linked and using the IR level linker to create a single linked but statically linked program. <coughs> and then run the static code generator. So with those parts, now you have fully automatic software multiplexing with fully automatic static linking. And I'll just show one more graph on results. I showed you the QT example earlier. This one is, I think, especially important because this is a common model for small websites. So many small websites, for, for example, for e-commerce and other ones, will run what's called a LEMP stack or a LAMP stack. Basically, it's a combination of four things. It's Linux, it's a web server, either Nginx or Apache. It's a database, either MySQL or MariaDB, often. And it's some kind of scripting language. So PHP is the most common one, right? So that stack is used to set up a whole website. And these are completely independent pieces of software. Um, they are not ever compiled together, usually. They're just independent binaries, normally. They're often packaged together and, and shipped. So for example, a Docker container may have these four sets of packages plus any dynamic libraries that are used with them. And by the way, the number n here just happens to be 37. Remember the n was the number of independent programs that were multiplex together, right? So there are 37 different programs that go into this package, not including Linux. Linux we're not including, it's right? just user space. And we multiplex all of them into one. It just worked fully automatically, basically out of the box. We didn't have to make any changes to the make files to do this. And um, you can just focus on the first three bars here. What this is showing is the aggregate static disk size for the programs, either with dynamic linking, the first pink bar, or with software multiplexing but with no compiler optimization. So the blue bar is sort of less important right now. And the green bar, which is uh, software multiplexing with full compiler optimizations. And basically by doing this automatic pass, we can make the whole program 44% smaller in size. And the other groups of bars show where the main benefits come from. It seems to come mainly from the database. But the point here is that for this very important <laughs> application category, you can get very substantial uh, size benefits. And this is a, basically a form of de-bloating. And de-bloating is the main goal of our whole ONR project. So if you're interested, this is the, that was the context that we did this in. I'll just give one more chart, actually. So this was running soft, the Allmux pass on various program collections. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Each bar here is a set of programs that are related to each other, either because they're normally built together as a single package, or in some cases, the ones with the dots will just combine a set of utilities that are normally similar. So like, um, for example, editors like GVIM and VIM or some basics X, X utilities, some com compression utilities. All the ones without dots are just normal packages that are shipped that are anyway built at, as one package. And so for each one of them, we basically ran multiplexing and um, again, the bars are the same. The 1.0 is the size of the dynamically linked version for each of the packages. So that's the baseline here. Ignore the blue one. The green one is really what, what uh, is, is the right one to look at. The green one is the geometric mean of the aggregate size for the software multiplex version with optimization. And you can see the geometric mean here is basically about 40% smaller than the dynamically linked version. And that's across a whole range of different packages 
where uh, the first one here just has two programs in it. The, la the largest one here has 167 different programs in one set. The, the, the package text live has 127 programs in one package. So this is just completely out of the box with no changes, building all these packages and getting very substantial reductions in what you have to ship for each of these packages. Okay, so I'm going to very briefly summarize the ongoing work that we're doing in all VM. Um, and I want to spend just five minutes on HP VM here, so I'm going to breeze through this a little bit. But we're now extending all mocks to look at function level deduplication, not just library level. And we want, in other words, now actually find semantically equivalent functions, not just syntactically equivalent ones like we did with libraries but either syntactic or semantic level equivalence of functions. So we can find deduplication. And in fact, I have graphs showing how much there is. There's a lot of duplicate functions in programs. I won't have time to show you that here. Give me a minute, let me just try to fix it. Um, second, we are doing the translation. Let me actually skip that. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I said earlier we are doing translation validation of LLVM code to x86, uh, to binary code. We're also doing reverse tra translation validation of the reverse, which is binary code to LLVM which are both important components of the all VM system. Um, in order to do that, you need a formal semantics of x86-64. And so we have a paper coming up in PLDI, which is an executable formal semantics. It's basically the almost complete user space x86-64 <laughs> instruction set. So it's by far the largest uh, uh, x86-64 semantics. And then finally, we're building what we call a bitcode database, which is basically taking this idea of all XEs to the max. It's imagine that all the code on a system is stored not as programs or libraries, but as individual functions in a database that you can search. Um, I think that has actually some very interesting applications. If you're interested in doing any kind of software engineering or any other kind of compiler research, um, this might be an interesting tool, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. OK, so I'm going to just spend a few minutes on HPVM, and then I will wrap up. Um, the context here is very different. It's heterogeneous parallel systems, and in some sense, in this world, virtual instruction sets are widely accepted. So unlike the last round of slides that I presented, where nobody uses virtual instruction sets for C and C++ and so on, right? Except Apple now does it to ship to their app store. But uh, in this case, everybody uses virtual instruction sets, but they're pretty limited in terms of what they can do. And so that was the HPVM project. And um, the idea here is to enable much better programmability for heterogeneous parallel systems. So the high-level goal is that in the context of mobile phone SOCs and supercomputers, and even these days cloud systems are getting more and more accelerators. You get FPGAs now on, on both Amazon and Azure. You get TPUs on the Google Cloud. Uh, and actually now on the Amazon Cloud also very soon you're going to get the inferential machine learning accelerator. The goal here is to be able to take high-level programming languages and com compile them down, compile a program in any one of these languages to any of the uh, heterogeneous compute units like uh, vector instruction sets, GPUs, domain specific accelerators, uh, digital signal processing, FPGAs, and others. And the way we go are doing that is by defining a virtual instruction set, which is an extension of LLVM, which we call HPVM. And there's a set of front ends that go to, or we haven't built these front ends, we are building them now. But in principle, you would have a set of front ends that go into a common virtual instruction set. And then have back end translators that generate code for a variety of different hardware targets. And that part we have more progress on so far. And the goal is to get portable code that you can ship. Virtual object code is basically the term that, that we use and people use and to have a parallel compiler IR that's highly retargetable so it can support a wide range of these systems. In order to do that, what you really need is to have common abstractions for these different sets of hardware. And that's really the main thing that we've done in the work and built the code generators for some of these. So the representation, so there are three main goals here which I will just very quickly mention which is to have a common representation that can be used as a virtual instruction set. It can be used as a compiler IR for optimizations. But in the case of runtime, in, in the case of heterogeneous parallel systems where scheduling is especially important with good abstractions, we also want to be able to use the same representation for runtime scheduling. Um, 
And so that's what HPVM allows us to do. And it's a generalization of LLVM, as I said. So the abstraction looks like this. It's basically a data flow graph, but not a pure data flow graph. So it has side effects because modern heterogeneous systems typically have shared memory between different units. So for example, it's becoming common for GPUs to have shared memory with the host processor. Also, there's a lot of research and systems in development and industry now that are having that have richer memory protocols in an SOC, for example. Um, so we allow explicit side effects, which are basically loads and stores through pointers to a common address space across different nodes in the system. But in addition to that, the data flow graph is hierarchical. And in particular, any node here itself can internally be a full data flow graph. And you can have multiple levels of that. So all the computations happen in the leaf graph, the lowest level graph. Any higher level graph, or what we call a parent node in the graph, will only contain a data flow graph if it's not a leaf node. Okay. And the idea is that the graph nodes here capture either coarse grain or fine grain computation tasks where the coarse grain case where they are either a lot of code or a whole graph in itself. The graph edges represent explicit data transfer. So this is sort of like a message, like a data copy. If it's within a single shared memory system, it doesn't have to be implemented as a copy. You can pass a pointer, but the semantics is like a copy. The loads and stores in the code implement implicit communication or basically shared memory across nodes. And the hierarchy allows us to represent <laughs> multiple levels of nested parallelism which is very important in heterogeneous systems because you have parallelism across large compute units like, like the GPU and the FPGA or the, or the CPU and the FPGA or the, Excel, uh, the machine learning accelerator or something like that. But then you also have a lot of parallelism within a single compute unit, like within a GPU or within an FPGA. Or whatever, right? So the hierarchy is very important for that. Turns out it also is a very good way to capture tiling. Um, I won't say much more about that today, but I can tell you more or the paper certainly has lots more details. So the idea here is that in the data flow graph at compile time, a single node comes with a vector, um, a symbolic vector that tells how to instantiate the nodes at runtime into parallel uh, tasks. Just like in an OpenCL or CUDA program, the kernel is instantiated into a grid of threads. Right? Um, so here again, a node gets instantiated and so that a dynamic data flow graph will have independent parallel instances of that node. And that's how you get either fine grain or coarse grain parallelism on a single node. And the graph structure uh, at compile time captures coarse grain task parallelism and pipeline parallelism on streaming data. Um, it, basically, the point I'm trying to make here, which I will uh, not spend more time on, is that there are several different kinds of parallelism that are important in accelerators. And this model, we believe, captures all of them the only one we've not actually shown so far is on semi-custom or domain-specific accelerators, which we're working on now in a DARPA project. Um, but we've actually been showing this for FPGAs already right now. And so the idea is that this <coughs> model captures all the different parallelism models in a heterogeneous system in one unified parallel abstraction. And so as an example, this is a pipeline edge detection program for uh, black and white images that has, at a high level, six pipeline stages. But in fact, two of those stages internally have additional parallelism and pipelining within them. And that's what the subgraph within this node shows here and similarly here. And uh, this is basically just a streaming data flow graph for images flowing through the pipeline. And that representation <coughs> is the HPVM representation for this. Um, and HPVM now serves as both the virtual ISA and the internal representation. So as a virtual ISA, it allows, it's really the key to performance portability because you can ship code in this form and then optimize and generate code for it. You can now do target-specific optimizations and target-specific code generation, which is what GPU languages like PTX and HSA also aim to do. Um, but you can also use this as an IR, and that is part of the point here, that front ends can generate this directly from the front end uh, language. It can be used directly for optimizations and code generation, unlike something like JVM bytecode, where you don't want to use that as the IR because it's not a good representation for compiler transmission. 
So we, there are a number of optimizations that you can express on the HPVM graph representation, like tiling for memory hierarchy, node merging, pipelining. Uh, we're doing a whole a more uh, combined algorithm for graph partitioning and, and merging for heterogeneous systems or SOCs. And that's part of the DARPA project right now. And also a variety of loop-based optimizations. But I won't talk about that in any more detail. I'm going to have to skip that right now in the interest of time. Uh, I was going to show a simple node merging uh, example here. But just to give you a quick sense of the performance impact of using a common abstraction like this, we compared um, for the parboil benchmark, we, benchmarks, we took hand-tuned versions for the GPU, for, the, for an NVIDIA GPU, and hand-tuned versions for Intel AVX vector instruction sets. And uh, we also compiled those, uh, we, we wrote HPVM versions of those benchmarks. Um, and map, and then compared the performance to the hand coded versions. And um, essentially what we found is that for the GPU, we're within 22% of hand-tuned performance in all the benchmarks. Um, and in fact, very close in all but two of them. Um, and I won't spend too much time on that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. But on the, uh, on the vector case, we were within 20% of all except one where we had a, if I, so the issue here was that the, the uh, hand-tuned version was using a feature that the compiler just didn't, wasn't using, and so there wasn't, uh, so we were losing significant performance on that. Um, it's also used for static scheduling. I will skip over that here. The most, the current work that we're doing on the DARPA project <laughs> is to use HPVM in a workflow an iterative workflow for doing hardware synthesis. So if, so if you want to do custom hardware synthesis for uh, domain-specific accelerators within a heterogeneous SOC, um, some components of an application may fit well on domain-specific accelerators, but many others may not. And um, there are tools to do explicit design space exploration and identify components that might match to existing accelerators like a convolution accelerator or a matrix multiplier. But to actually identify which parts of an application to map to that, you need to do the partitioning and fusion that I talked about earlier. So HPVM now is something we're using in an, in a, in an iterative workflow to drive this kind of design space exploration, mapping to a uh, heterogeneous SOC. Um, that's something we're just starting on now. So that sort of brings me to the ongoing work we have with HPVM. We have, we have a few different directions going on. Um, one of them is what we call a prox HPVM, where we are trying to take application level accuracy, so flexibility. So for example, if you can allow uh, some increase in error in inference for a machine learning application, or some decrease in frame rate for a video image processing application, or something like that, then small uh, errors or small um, amounts of flexibility can give very substantial increases in performance and energy. Um, so for example, we can get 2.8 to 20x reduction in energy for neural networks with only a 1% increase in inference error. Um, so that's something that we can do automatically and we're doing that with Approx HPVM for a variety of different approximation methods. We're also doing for FPGAs, a compiler from HPVM to FPGAs, which we have a working prototype off right now. We're trying to now work on making that much more powerful. And the goal there is that today's high-level synthesis tools aim to do this, but you need to have a lot of hardware expertise to use them, which most application teams do not have. We're trying to make it possible to really take hardware agnostic applications and get good FPGA designs out of them. And finally, uh, mapping high-level domain-specific languages to heterogeneous systems, again, so that non-experts are able to program complex heterogeneous systems. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I apologize for running over a few minutes here. I'd be happy to take any more questions. The last slide here is just a summary of what I said earlier, which is that we believe all future software should ship as virtual instruction sets, and there are significant benefits for
my question goes back to the de-bloating. De bloating yeah. Yeah. So um, the reason you suggested the static library, the static machine for the whole system optimization uh, is that to eliminate the uh, bloating that comes to the dynamic library. Well, so it's kind of tricky because what happens is that with static libraries, you can do better optimization. So you can eliminate more code on individual applications. So that bloat gets much better. That's right. But then the shared library issue is still a separate issue. So that sounds like a very useful thing to do. I will guess okay, right, that because they're doing it at low time on, on native machine code, they can, they're much less effective in what kind of analysis they can do. So for example, if you eliminate a particular function call, let's say, right, because they're in the compiler, you can actually identify parts in the code that will never be taken. And machine code is very, very you can do much better optimization than you're doing the same thing for, for unused code. It comes with the lesser uh, issues in terms of updating. Uh, yeah, but I don't know if that's that important. So there are cases where it's important and cases where it's not. <coughs> but you're right. It does come Thank you. So I need to stay in the middle because the projector is blinding. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. So no, thank you. I understand that there is a lot of programming languages can be compiled to LVN or like OL and IR, but in, uh, but the fact that they, the IR they compile or generate are like totally different. They have a lot of like their own like language constructor and also they will like depend on the target architecture. So do you mean intrinsic? So like why is it different? You mean you're talking about in LVM intrinsic that might be? Uh, yeah, like intrinsic and attributes. Like there is a lot of like uh, programming language different attributes and intrinsics. So yeah. do we need to like normalize and do you provide a, like a formal form of the form, uh, normalized form? Yeah. yeah, so you're absolutely right. There are a, quite a lot of intrinsics, especially intrinsics that are hardware specific. There are some intrinsics and attributes that are language specific. Yes, like both. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I think the right way to think about it is that the intrinsics and the attributes are very much part of the LLVM IR semantics. Yes. They're not foreign, they're like, yes. they are part of the semantics. They're very well defined. We know exactly what they mean, right? Yes. So you should be able to do, if you have a compiler pass that handles all the intrinsics and all the attributes, that is not a problem. And sometimes you basically will handle all those languages uniformly. Yeah. In fact, that's what happens is that people get, I shouldn't say lazy, they don't get lazy, but they don't have the time to do every yeah. possible intrinsic and every possible attribute. Yeah. And so uh, the actual compiler passes may only handle a subset. So in that case, you'll get some, some impact from that. But I don't think it's actually, um, it's not necessarily gonna hurt those, those languages because this, those passes are not gonna do anything with those languages anyway. Yeah, but, but it will lose some like opportunities for the optimization. For yes, yeah. I think what you, I think what you're saying, and I would agree with that, is that if you could do all the possible intrinsics and all the attributes, you could do even better. Yes. Yeah. So the potential benefit you get would be not as good as you could get if you did everything. But it won't be any worse than what they do today. Uh, yeah, it won't be worse. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much <laughs> again.